What about making that investment in later cycle testing, in, in better system testing by a developer or communities of developers, dog fooders, and beta testers? What about that? Can I place my bet there and say, OK, I'm going to invest a lot more in this late cycle stuff? Well, there's problems with this, too, and we've already talked about those problems, right? We've got the problem of all of these people filing 200 of copies of the same bug. How are we going to solve that problem? Because that problem and a bunch of them like it, if I can't, if I don't have some idea there, uh, we've got a big problem. So here's what I'd really like. And these numbers, though, so this is the part that's not, this presentation is a work in progress because uh, we know how to compute these. We're computing these at Google. Uh, we're going to be releasing this. So this product is going to be released. It's going to be an open source, and it's going to be called Google Test Analytics. Um, but I, I, the math isn't quite proven yet. Um, we're still using it internally. But here's what I'd like. I'd like a risk mitigation index. And it's going to start somewhere around 1, right? 1, 100% risk. Perfect risk. <laughs> and then as testing happens, the risk should go down. So that as my testers start testing, the risk goes down from 100% to 91%. And that's, you know, I've reached my value there. I know that my internal testers, that's all they can do. And then I give it to the crowd. And the crowd does scenarios that I couldn't do before. And the risk goes down. And then from the crowd, I give it to dog fooders. And the dog fooders run scenarios that the crowd and the individual testers couldn't do, and the risk goes down even further. And then we send it out to beta, and they run a whole new set of scenarios that cover new risks in the product, and the risk goes down further until we get to the point where we say, okay, it's right now our number, our rule of thumb is when the risk goes below 50%. Um, it, it seems to be the point at which we release. This is what I would like. But what this implies is that, and this is the real game changer, is that these people can't be run, working on different sets of rules. You know, the, the dog fooders need to know what the crowd people did, and the crowd people need to know what the internal testers did. If we're all working on the same set of rules, this can actually be a cumulative process. Right now, it's not. My internal testers do one thing, and then I give it to U-tests, and they don't know what we did. They do their stuff. And then we give it to the dog fooders, and the dog fooders don't say, okay, well, let's see what the testers did. Let's make sure... We're, you know, we're executing new scenarios and covering new risks. They don't do any of that. It's all completely disconnected. So that's the real game changer. The real game changer is to be able to connect all of this so that each of these processes <coughs> learn from the last process and they actually grow into something that's far bigger than, than, than itself. So this is really the kind of idea that, that I want to get across is that I want to be able to do software testing a lot more um, risk-based. So we, we really need to understand that this is the collection of the most important things to test and make testers do that. So hopefully this number is going to go down substantially. And then now that those are tested, we have this second tier of risks that are the next most important things to test. So see, connecting these guys together means understanding that risk profile. So what do we do? And how do we need to do this? We start with what we call the attributes of the system. So for example, a human being has attributes. They have, um, they're alive, they're responsive, they're intelligent, they're strong, right? These are attributes of being a human being. Now, well, what makes you strong? So there are components of a human being that make them strong, arms, legs, etc. The brain makes them smart. Software is the same way. If you take Chrome, for example, what are the attributes of Chrome? Well, it's fast. That's, uh, it's secure. Um, and and you, you, you can list these things. And there are you know, a small number of these for any piece of software. And then the final set is a set of capabilities that um, uh, this software can actually perform. So let's take a look at how we do this. So this is a small snippet of ACC, Attribute Component Capability Analysis, for Chrome operating system. So down the uh, left-hand side are all of the components. Across the top are the attributes, open source, fast, secure, et cetera. And then within each of those buckets, there's a capability. 
A capability is something that the software can do. It's a verb. So if you follow this grammatically through, we're not going to write a test plan. We're going to come up with the adverbs and adjectives that describe the software. Those are the attributes. Then we're going to list all the nouns, the components of the software. Those are the, compo the components. And then we're going to list all the verbs, everything that the software can do. And that's all we're going to do. We're not going to do any other test planning. That represents the testing surface of the application. All of those capabilities need to be exercised, period. Now, you might think it's going to be a really big number. It's not a big number, at least not Google software. Google software, a Chrome operating system has 314 of these things. Chrome itself has less than that. Um, we, haven't, we haven't met a product yet that has more than 314 of these things. 314 things the software can do. Now, it can do it in various ways. There may end up being multiple test cases against those capabilities. But do you see what I'm headed toward here? I have, got, I have got the sum total of testing of this software defined. And I can start tracking it. I can take a test case and attach it to a capability. I can take four test cases and attach it to a capability. If the code under that capability is changed, I need to rerun those four test cases. And you can see how risk comes apart. As soon as you get that entire testing surface defined, that's 100% risk. We've not run a single test case through this that shows the risk has been mitigated. As you run test cases, you understand which part of the attack surface, uh, the testing surface you've run across, you're mitigating risk. Every single test case, the software is getting less and less risky to release, or it should. So here's how we manage this. Um, this is a little attributes component capabilities matrix. So this is just a piece of it. So for example, um, in the hardware, simple elegant, simple elegant is the attribute, hardware is the component. There are five capabilities there that we need to test. There are five verbs that describe how that hardware is simple and elegant. And we need to test those. Now, this is what the testing, actual testing surface looks like for Chrome operating system. Each of these things, um, each of the, uh, the rows are all of the components of Chrome operating system, and that's it. Now, the size of that line represents the number of capabilities on each of those, on each of those components. And they're color-coded based on the attribute that they, that they code. Now, at this point, we can do a lot of interesting things. I can take five testers and say, I want you guys to go and write test cases for everything there that's orange or blue. And I can start splitting people up so that they're not colliding into each other. Here's another one. This is, um, so if you got to look at this, those, those peaks are pointing up. The higher the peak, the more testing work we have to do for that particular component attribute pair. So this is probably the one I find the most useful. So the closer those circles are to the middle, the far more important that they are to test because they're riskier features for the software. You can, you can click on one of these, and it will tell you how many test cases represent, how many test cases have been written for this particular capability. And it'll list them all there, how many times they've failed. So it'll give you, it'll give you information about it. So the first thing I want, one of my testers comes in in the morning, they should, they should see this on their screen. And they should take a look at it, and they should say, OK, I've got these guys, and I need to push these guys back. It's a game. So the more testing you do here, the further back this thing gets pushed. And, and ultimately, what you want is you want all of the, the circles to be around here, right? Because these are all testable capabilities. This is a testing surface. You would want them all here. The worst case would be every single one of them is right here. That means every single thing is its maximum risk value. It's not been tested. But I want this on a monitor in my, on my testing floor. And I want every tester seeing this, every developer seeing this in real time. So as you start pushing this back, a developer makes a change to the code, and it goes right back here. We've got to rerun all these test cases. How do we? How do we actually do testing? So we built a tool. Uh, we call it the tester's heads up display. And here's kind of the idea behind, behind the tool. I want to see the data in my workspace. So just like a video game player, you don't have to leave the game ever. 
any information you need about the game is displayed, overlaid on top of the game, like this. This is what I want to do. So this is my heads-up display. Let's just leave this for a second. And here's bug information displayed on the screen. So I'm testing this web page. I've got one, two, three, four bugs right now outstanding against this web page. Three, three of them are red. That means they've been found, they've been reported, but they've not yet been fixed. There's actually, it'll, it'll turn less red and go into orange as they've been diagnosed by a developer. So we look at the bug database, we see that the developer's checked out the bug, they've looked at it, and they've written something in the, the bug database entry. So we make it a little more orange. So you don't have to go to the bug database now. Everything's displayed here. This one's yellow. That means it's been found, reported, and fixed, but no new test cases have been run against it. So as test cases will get run against it, it'll start turning blue into green. And then when it's green, it'll eventually disappear because green means it's been validated. And it goes away, and now, now testers know about it. So right away, I've solved a whole bunch of problems. I don't have my testers going around fiddling around in a bunch of databases. I have that data displayed right on top of their workspace. Second problem I've solved is this problem of the U-test guys, the dog fooders, the internal testers all reporting the same bug. You're not going to report this bug. The system's not going to allow you to report this bug. 